everyone. While I have touched on the seven Brunstrom stages of stroke recovery before, I wanna take a deeper dive today. We're going to talk about what is physically happening in each stage of recovery and what you can do to help. Let's get into it. The Brunstrom approach and stages of stroke recovery were developed by a Swedish physiotherapist named Signe Brunstrom in the 1960s. It was used to help medical professionals better understand movement recovery after a stroke. This was and is a unique approach because it views typically problematic muscle tone like spasticity as an indicator that recovery is actually happening. It's important to note though that these stages aren't perfectly linear. You may not start at stage one and then move through them all in sequence. In fact, it's pretty common for stroke survivors to get stuck in one of these stages. But the more that you understand about each one, the better you can advocate for yourself. Stage one, flaccidity. So this stage primarily happens after a severe brain injury or stroke. Often you won't see this phase in someone who has had a mild or moderate stroke. There's usually no voluntary or active movement and the affected limbs may be limp and floppy. Now there are two main things that we wanna consider in this stage, passive range of motion and positioning strategies. Passive range of motion is when someone can't actively move and they have to have someone else passively move and stretch their affected limbs. They can't actively move. Why is this so important? Well, it all comes back to neuroplasticity. We want the brain to begin remaking those neural connections or pathways from the brain to the body. There has to be some sort of input for that to happen, which is why stretching and passive movement is so important. Having someone move and stretch the affected limb is a great way to get this process started, as well as to prevent any muscle or tendon shortening, which can lead to contractures. And contractures are where muscles are permanently shortened and movement can be extremely limited. The second thing we wanna consider in this stage are positioning strategies. It's really important to keep the affected limb positioned safely to avoid injuries and also to prevent and manage shoulder subluxation. If you wanna know more about managing shoulder subluxation, check out this video linked above. It's important to note that you wanna keep your arms out of traditional slings that put your arm in this position and you wanna support the upper arm and the shoulder, whether it's with pillows, if you're laying down on your back or on your side, or keeping the arm supported on a table while sitting up. Stage two, spasticity develops. In this stage, someone might notice tighter muscle tone that gets worse with quick movements. And that muscle tone change is also known as spasticity. In simple terms, spasticity is essentially caused by two things, an abnormally triggered reflex, which causes muscles to tighten and contract too much, and by the injured part of the brain's inability to stop that overactive reflex. Now, while it might seem counterintuitive, the development of spasticity from the first stage, flaccidity, is actually a good thing. This means that the brain is trying to remake those pathways. It's just that the connection is weak. Sort of like having a hard time hearing someone when um, a cell phone signal is weak. You get parts of the conversation, but not all of it. You may also notice that some abnormal limb synergies develop in this stage. Abnormal limb synergies are when you get multiple unwanted muscle movements that are happening at the same time, and they make it hard to do daily things. Muscles begin to move, but it's usually involuntary. And it's when you might see elbows, wrists, and fingers bend without really trying. It becomes slightly more difficult to have someone move your limbs in this stage. Now, even though there is little motor control in this stage, you want to try to continue moving your recovering limb as much as you can. It's okay if that movement isn't perfect or if you only get just a tiny amount. It becomes easy in this stage to develop something called learned non-use or learning to not use your affected side. Now, even if you're able to get some active movement, continue to have someone do slow stretches and passively move your affected side. Stage three, increased spasticity. 
Unfortunately, spasticity gets worse before it gets better. That abnormally triggered reflex and the brain's inability to stop that reflex continues to cause tight, stiff, and sometimes painful muscles resulting in limited movement. Again though, an increase in spasticity means that the brain is trying to remake those pathways. Because movement can become really limited in this stage due to pain and tightness, there are a lot of things that we need to consider. Now, personally, I usually recommend talking with your doctor or neurologist about medications, Botox injections, or even acupuncture treatments that can help relieve stiffness and pain. Now, those options don't actually treat the underlying cause of spasticity, but they can help treat the symptoms. And this is important because if you're able to limit spasticity, even temporarily, you can work on movement, which is necessary to create those neuroplastic brain changes. You'll want to continue to either self-stretch or have someone help you stretch your affected limbs daily. Continue to try and move your affected side as much as you can during your daily activities. And also in this stage, depending on the amount of spasticity you experience, you may want to consider the use of splints to prevent or manage contractures, which is a shortening and hardening of muscles and tendons. Now, this is something you'll want to talk to your doctor or your therapist about, firstly, to make sure that it's the right treatment for you, and secondly, to determine what type of splint might be right for your situation. And lastly, but no less important, try to limit stress as much as you can. Stress can increase spasticity and also decrease mood. Stage four, decreased spasticity. In this stage, spasticity begins to reduce. You might notice the return of some voluntary movements and also experience improved control and coordination over those movements. This stage is really important for making movement gains. You'll wanna capitalize on it with a variety of strategies, including continuing with a daily exercise routine for your recovery. Now your therapist may have a specific routine they want you to go through, but if you don't have anyone to help, I have a lot of general workouts for stroke recovery here on my channel. You can check out my stroke recovery exercise playlist for more information. Now you can also ask your doctor or your therapist about using functional e-stem or electrical stimulation to help you continue making gains. However, the most important thing that I recommend is to continue moving your affected limbs as much as possible, either by yourself or with someone helping or both. You wanna fight learned non-use by using that affected side in as many daily activities as you can, like getting dressed, taking a shower, and even making a meal. You can try holding a washcloth or a sponge in your affected hand, practice putting on a t-shirt using your affected arm as much as possible, or use your affected arm to stabilize a piece of bread while you make a sandwich. Stage five, minimal spasticity. In this stage, brain signals to the affected limbs are improving. Spasticity is still hanging around, but it's not impeding movement too much. You may notice that you're more easily able to do complex movements and that dexterity and fine motor skills of your hands are starting to return. You may notice that some of those abnormal limb synergies begin to improve in this stage as well. Now, you'll want to continue to focus on active exercises, but you can also begin moving into a strengthening routine as well. In your daily activities, you wanna start focusing on more controlled and fine motor movements. Try picking up a spoon or fork, holding a toothbrush, or even holding a pencil and trying to write with your affected hand. Repetition and consistency are key in this stage. Stage six no spasticity and return of coordination. In this stage, spasticity completely resolves. Motor control is almost fully restored except for some lingering coordination issues. You'll want to continue with active range of motion exercises and a strengthening routine. However, you'll also want to start with a home dexterity routine. This stage is where you can hone in and develop those small deliberate movements. And if you don't know where to start, you can check out this video that shows you 15 different activities you can do at home to work on your dexterity. Stage seven, normal movement. 
In this stage, spasticity is not present. The brain and muscles are communicating effectively. Typical and normal movement returns. You want to keep actively moving and strengthening your whole body if you are in this stage. Now, I often get asked, will I return to 100% of my pre-stroke self? Or essentially this last Brunstrom stage. And unfortunately, I don't have an answer to that. Every stroke survivor's journey is very different based on the severity of the stroke, where in the brain it happened, and how healthy someone was prior to their stroke. It's important to have the expectation of two steps back, one step forward, because stroke recovery progress is slow and it doesn't happen in any expected or linear pattern. But I also know that survivors who put in real effort into their stroke recovery journey and they don't let plateaus stop them will make more progress. So regardless of what stage you're in, there is always the possibility of progress. All right, everyone, that's it for today. If you would leave me a comment and let me know, does learning about these stages of recovery feel helpful to you in your own recovery journey? And as always, I am going to leave a link down in the description below if you would like to sign up for the email list, which gets you free stroke recovery tips and motivational emails every week, as well as a free copy of my ebook, The Stroke Recovery Pocket Guide. And if you find value in what we do and you're able, please consider donating to Post Stroke, either via PayPal for a one-time donation or by becoming a Patreon member, where in exchange for a monthly donation, you get access to cool perks like social media shoutouts, behind the scenes videos, and even YouTube shoutouts, of which I have one today. Thank you again, Doug C, for donating at the Empower level. We cannot do what we do without you. Thank you all so much for watching. I'll see you next time.